So we, Robert and I just talked and we thought, you know, well, let's keep the Q&A format um, because it's been working out well so far. Um, but I just wanted to uh, really let, let Robert kind of talk here. We want to get a little technical, get a little deeper into the kind of architecture behind something like BeyondCorp. You know, some of the technical reasons why we believe that BeyondCorp is the right architecture. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about some of the decisions that we've made from a product perspective at, at ScaleFT and, and why we why we believe those are the right things. Um, but Robert, just to give a little context, is a co-founder uh, of, of ScaleFT. Uh, Robert's the smartest person I know. Uh, <laughs> and I, I always learn so much from, from speaking with Robert. Uh, the topic that we wanted to kind of talk about today, and when you look at BeyondCorp from an architecture, and you look at zero trust. Zero trust is about removing trust in the network. The network, let's talk about the OSI layers. Does everybody remember back to your college courses of the OSI model. The network was meant for transport. Quick question. Did you study the OSI No, model? I did not. Okay, I was just in wondering. business school. Yeah, just wondering. I was, uh, I was playing sports and going out and drinking. That's, so yeah, you know, that's, what that's, that's why I'm been getting that my whole that's life. That's why I'm in marketing, interviewing smart people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but going back to the OSI model and zero trust, we're removing trust in the network. We've got to put it somewhere. Now, let's talk about layer seven Authorization you're killing, decision. You're application me, layer. I, you're killing me. Why are we removing trust in the network and why are we putting it at the application layer? Go. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry for teasing Ivan, everybody. This is meant to be a whiteboard session, but we have this fireplace instead. And I just, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to be conversational uh, with the group. I was asked, you know, hey, there's going to be a bunch of people attending a Beyond Court meetup. What would you want to talk to them about? And I was like, well, you know, I think. It's nice at an event like RSA to get away from the buzzwordiness and the hype around things like Beyond Corp and Zero Trust. Zero Trust is like an analyst category, and that's fine. I really think that uh, these conceptual frameworks have a big role in helping organizations achieve change and helping people communicate about their work. But there's also an engineering component to these decisions, uh, and I feel like that gets underplayed a lot of the time. I think that in a lot of ways, Beyond Corp is something that we could derive uh, working purely from an engineering perspective, you know, and I think engineering is in part about the application of uh, You know whatever technology you have to bear on like a real problem But there's also a, a dimension of it where we can reason abstractly about the problem that we're trying to solve uh, For beyond Corp, I think of that problem as authorization. We're trying to solve the problem of authorization I think it's something that we can just sort of think about on an abstract level uh, Plus I think they put me at the last session of the day um, just to try and jump start uh, into the second half where we're all going to be hanging lunch. out and having a conversation. <laughs> It'll be more active than just sitting in a dark room. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to sit in a dark room and just chill in the back with their laptops <laughs> and read. I fully support that and I wouldn't interrupt it. But anyone who wants to have a conversation about uh, authorization or especially beyond Corp as an architecture or from an engineering point of view, I'm also interested in that. So, actually, just to read the room, how many people here identify as engineers? I'm just curious. Is it everybody? Almost everybody? And don't feel segmented here. So like, I think that probably people just don't want to engage. And that's, I'm assuming we're all engineers. But whatever it means, I think that the principled reasoning of engineering is in part not caring who's an engineer. You know, We should try as much as we can to evaluate ideas, uh, not on the basis of the authority of who's saying them, or if they have a microphone, or if the lights are pointed at them, but how good those ideas are. Uh, so I think with I've been banking on having a microphone as you're my doing authority. Great, Ivan. I think you're, you're really fantastic. <laughs> Ivan had no idea what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I said why authorization is a layer seven decision. So I think that that's something that, um, to be honest, is probably a bad uh, topic. Uh, layer seven authorization is not something that's in any question at all. What is the problem of authorization? Well, abstractly, we could say you have a user, you have a resource, you have some policies applied to the resource that are you know, maybe they're static RBAC, or it's dynamic device posture driven stuff like we talk about with Beyond Corp. But one way or another, uh, those policies should guide whether the user can access the resource. And that's pretty much the subject, I was just looking at this the other night, of the first uh, RFC listed as a SAML RFC, uh, which was, uh, I think that was written like 20 years ago, or it's a long it's time a ago. While. I was like probably in college reading the RFC and like, this is fantastic, the internet is gonna be great. Uh, you know, it's a layer seven solution for authorization. Okay, but why don't we just use SAML for everything if SAML is so great? You know, what, what 
What are the limitations there? So that's actually Ivan. Okay. That's what I wanted to kind of talk over with somebody. And I figured everybody here would be a great, a great person to do that with. Um, I think that uh, one thing that comes to mind is that when I was describing the problem of authorization, I was saying authorization is a user, a resource, and some policies. But really, the problem is way harder than that because uh, reality is scattered all over the place. Reality is a distributed system. Uh, the components, your user is in one place, your resource is in one place. God knows where your policies are. Your components are scattered all over the place, too. Thank you for the, f the feedback. I really love the conversational style. Uh, you are my favorite audience member right now. No offense, everybody. But yeah. uh, We all have work to do, apparently. Yeah, it's a, it, there's a balance. And definable and updatable, those are kind of a, what is the truth? Well, you're storing the truth here, but it's changing over there. You need right. to be able to receive updates about the truth, right? Exactly. And so I think that's one half of the distributed challenges of Beyond Corp is that you've got kind of a telemetry problem. Um, you could actually think not only of the devices that people are using as a source of data for a telemetry type system, but you could think of the configuration backend as a source for telemetry, like wherever you're database is, and it might not just be a database of user identity or devices, it might be a database of your group definitions, you know, and then of course if you have multiple organizations involved, you've got federation challenges, and that's also a distributed system problem. And so I kind of think about that's half of the challenge. Half of the challenge is the truth comes from everywhere, and you want to be able to make a good decision, you know, and with author authorization, you know, you've got kind of default deny, so if you're not really sure, what's up? First you got to get them to say what they're yeah, oh, you're saying like, yeah, that's a telemetry problem too, right? You're, you're saying basically, look, you've got like an organization, you have to somehow collate the truth out of this nebulous cloud of people and find out, okay, are people actually in different groups or what should the rules be for who can access what? Yeah, that's totally a challenge. Uh, so for another half of it that I think of though is, um, and this is, I think, more where architectural distinctions between, for example, SAML and BeyondCorp come into play is uh, the resources in question must be able to validate the credential, whatever it is. Uh, and so I think credentials came up earlier in mm -hmm. Ivan's discussion with Mark, just very briefly. And Mark uh, treated upon something that I think that we're all really familiar with, with credentials, which is you know passwords and then other types of user-born uh, identifiers like a private key. Those are all uh, the types of credential that are visible to you as a person. But for any type of system that you're interacting with, there's always credentials that are sort of being used to facilitate that in the back end, whether that's between um, a SAS that you're interacting with and the database it's accessing on your behalf, and whether it's doing so because you gave it a bearer token or because it implicitly has the permissions to do so or because it's able to impersonate you. There are millions of ways that these types of systems can work, but they're all under the hood. They're transiting these credentials, and those credentials aren't necessarily something that are visible to you as a user. So we heard, um, I think, from a couple people that sometimes from a user experience standpoint, when you're transitioning to a Beyond Corp model, the user doesn't necessarily know the difference. And I think that that's a, a facilitator of that is the fact that it's actually replacing credentials on the back end. The user facing credential, whatever it is, whether it's an RSA token, your Duo phone or app or whatever, is, uh, is still the same because that's authenticating you as a person, providing an attestation of your identity, which becomes a data point that enters some type of system which might like have an architecture that supports a concept of telemetry or some type of distributed system solution like Kafka that streams the truth to wherever the credential will be issued. But it might not. It might just write it into a database. But then uh, whatever software that you're interacting with, because we as people, if you think about it, uh, we as people are never actually on the internet, right? Like the internet is this like, abstract plane where machines are interfacing with each other and then as a human being there's always like a user interface or some software that you've uh, you've granted permissions to and that really that connection is I think where a massive amount of security issues start is because implicitly simply by using software we're granting the use of our identity to some other agent you know and how trustworthy is that agent so this is, these, this is just kind of the kind of things that come into mind. And that's when I said, why is layer seven an author, or sorry, why is authorization a layer seven problem? I mean, I was like, this is way too obvious and easy, right? If you look at the OSI model, uh, which I can remember 
some mnemonic that lets you remember them all. And oh, I, yeah, I mostly I skip remember. layer five, but I mean the point is that the user is actually not the user being one of the components of a policy or uh, authorization like problem domain description. The user is not defined in OSI layer two, right? Uh, OSI layer three also doesn't have a user concept. You actually don't get to a user concept until you get to layer seven. So it's sort of really obvious and easy that authorization would be a layer seven problem because you literally can't solve it in any other way. But the reality is that the way that we as engineers uh, have solved these problems historically is just like, okay, great, so we've collected all the truths. We know the group memberships of all the people in the organization. Like, we know the rules around what they're supposed to access. Let's find a way to serialize it out into some kind of static topology, whether that's through writing a million network rules or writing 5,000 public keys across a million machines. One way or another, you're like, okay, we've, we've determined what reality is. Let's just blast it out in the form of some static configuration and call it good then we can go home and everything's secure. But you know the realities are always changing and that doesn't allow you to take real time uh, considerations into account around like, okay, great, you've got a user on a device, but which device is it? Okay, great, they're on the same device as yesterday, but what's that device's status? That approach to solving the problem architecturally doesn't really enable you uh, to have those factors accounted for whatsoever. So I mean, this is kind of the thing that I was thinking about when you said yeah. earlier, Ivan, that uh, an ephemeral credential is required, right? I mean, when people think about ephemeral credentials, we're at, like, this is an RSA, like, alternative event. We're thinking about RSA tokens, like, yeah. it's ephemeral, it keeps changing, but the reality is the possession of that token is actually a static attribute of you as a person, right? Humans, just like we're never on the internet, we never interact with truly uh, ephemeral credentials. Like, I occasionally will dump an X509 certificate out on my screen, and yeah, I guess I'm interacting with an ephemeral credential, but the reality is that all of these things exist in that abstract plane of the internet, which is an architecture that we're trying to build and define that we can use to solve this problem. I don't know. Does anyone have any thoughts about this? Well, reality is never a snapshot. I think that's one. And so how do we then support that with engineering these changing environments? I don't know. Yeah. That's why it's, I guess, it's a layer it's seven a tough, decision. It's a tough problem. But then, you know, you're talking a lot about users, but it's not just users. We've talked about all sorts of things that are now inputs into this. How do you reason with the, the different things that do actually interface with the inter internet that are not always a human. I think you touched on it earlier. I mean, somebody <laughs> mentioned the fact that you have to lead by example. I, I remember what it was. I might have missed that part. Somebody had to lead us, Robert, yeah, to Robert. the promised land. No. <laughs> if you lead by example, basically, if you're going to set the tone and you talk about evangelizing, but really you are, I mean, you're creating an awareness. And the more people acquiesce to the awareness, the more momentum it takes. And that's going to dictate the actual API. That's going to actually dictate the, the application development. Because people are going to find out and follow in. But they yeah. have plenty of, if they want to get through the door, they're going to have to fall in line. That reminds me of a really good book that a friend of mine loaned me, I ha haven't given it back yet, called Leading Change. And I kind of think of there's a whole category of problems, and this has nothing to do with the OSI model, that are just like leading change, like how do organizations change? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I think that... Uh, Finish the book. <laughs> it's a really good book. I actually really <laughs> recommend the book Leading Change if anyone's interested in this type of problem. But, uh, I mean, yeah, that's something that is not from my point of view, is not uh, subject to an engineering solution, right? Which I think is actually the point. If you, you like building a policy, whether you're like, whether you're serializing your policy to network rules or whether you're serializing it to like a PDF and then handing it to everybody, one way or another, uh, you know, people do have to adopt that change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things when we, you know, especially when you're talking about Beyondcorp in a, in a Google perspective, you know, you might on the surface say lead by example, but we actually try to, guide people on an entirely different path than, than Google did, because that's just not realistic for other people. You can't, you can't necessarily follow exactly what they did and follow the example. What we say is that it's evidence that it, this is possible, that like a zero trust model and architecture is totally possible, um, but don't always do it the same way. So it'd be, you know, you gotta be careful uh, you know, following the examples that you have that are available and making sure that you're changing your organization or you're doing all of the right things for, for your use cases and your environments and supporting that. Right. Um, so you know, so yeah. I, I see that yeah. example of what you just said. I mean, I, I'm looking at it from a client perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm I think, not going to follow Google's example. Right. Necessarily. I don't know. I'm not going to follow into AWS. Are you really stuck with 
I do like to be on Let's go on that one, yeah. Stance of here's a platform that works, that makes sense, it's best practice, and it actually is the starting point. Yeah. Well, yeah. It can be evolved as, as things get refined. Right. And there's enough commonalities where we're not all unique snowflakes in terms of our cloud infrastructure and our, our, our controls. Um, but, you know, things like the way Google treats managed devices might not apply to your, your company. So it's more on that, that level than uh, I think let's make a new internet for every company. Referring <laughs> to Google as an example is something you do to persuade human beings of a solution which is great when you want to create change, but from my point of view, doesn't necessarily, even with Google's obviously fantastic reputation as an engineering organization, it doesn't, it's not that persuasive. I would love to see a rationale for, when I think of BeyondCorp, what is the essential uh, like nature of BeyondCorp? I don't think like, yeah, well, you know, Google started it with, again, a PDF actually, it's kind of funny. They serialized their uh, evangelism into a PDF uh, and then they distributed it to all of us. And then uh, from that grew a hype machine that we're all gonna ride out into the desert and a thousand years from now, the bones will spell beyond corp. You know, that's not really wow. like, that's not really how I'm, I'm, belief is created for me. For me, I think belief is created by an abstract understanding of why a solution is the correct uh, attack on a problem, and it's not a new problem. Authorization is an old problem, which is why I was going back and reading this old SAML spec, because honestly, they didn't even call it SAML back then, they just called it like a AAA service, and it makes sense. You think to yourself, well, hey, uh, why wouldn't you have a centralized service where you, 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 know, you can make all of your decisions centrally, and you've got all these resources that delegate responsibility to that service and defer to it whenever they want to make decisions, and that's actually how a lot of internet uh, identity problems work right now with OIDC and SAML and a bunch of other solutions. You know, you have an identity provider for which one way or another we may all have different corporate directories, but we're probably also uh, on Facebook. You know, there's many identity providers that are prepared to attest to us with different degrees of strength and different protocols, but uh, I think that uh, one of the major challenges of that is then how does it work from there on out? So when you think about identity as it transits a browser, it's always going to be a bearer token approach, one way or another. So you've got a signed JWT, this is pretty common. This exists as like a HTTP header and it goes to the service on the far end and the service on the far end verifies the signature of it. But, and from that they deduce your identity, you the human being on the other side of the browser. But the reality is that now that that service has your JWT in memory, you know, it is perfectly capable of acting as you against any other service. So in order to trust, this is the classic symmetrical you know, cryptography problem. In order to trust uh, your identity, you have been forced to present it with a credential that allows it to impersonate you, right? Now the WebAuth, uh, Paul, he's in the front row here, he shared a thing that I've been following that had some updates on WebAuth. They're, uh, they're gonna start using, wait, say that again? WebAuthn. WebAuthn, oh, got it. I've been saying WebAuth. But WebAuthn is more specific and also more terrible <laughs> as a name. Uh, yeah, so it, you know, they're gonna, it's a new API that we can use that will let us use private keys in browsers to assert our identities. And you're like, great, so does that solve the problem of authorization? And uh, obviously the answer obviously is not no. not if it's the web off end. That, thank you. <laughs> That's exactly where I was going with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's exact, yes, it's all about practical mitigations. Like it's far better than passwords, but it doesn't really tell you that you're you necessarily. It means now you're in possession of a browser as opposed to a static credential that's more easily stolen because a human has to manage it. Again, humans are the challenge here. With this model, your private key is going straight into the cryptographic store of your laptop and I doubt that you're called upon to remember it. What's up? So you're uh, conflating, or maybe beforehand, conflating the authentication problem with the authorization. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to conflate them, but I did think the standard was ca called WebAuth. Just kidding. But yeah, I wouldn't want to conflate them, but I think they're really related, right? Um, I, I think of authorization as ultimately the goal, right? Authentication is just a means to an end. Who is the user? Okay, great, now we know who you are and that's part of the problem domain of authorization, right? I think of authentication as really just like a mechanism in the authorization problem. But yeah, they're related and I would hate to be imprecise. Have you looked at, have you looked at sort of the research on like things like proof carrying authorization? No. Which is sort of a, you, everyone has an identity and you can sort of specify the actions and chain it based on a set of rules. 
I, don't, I have no idea, but that sounds really interesting. Will you? Will you? Would you share that with me after the session? Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, ideas uh, in progress for OAuth spec. Uh, one is the proof of possession where um, the access token is really abstract, where uh, you go ask for the neighbor's access token back in order to try, you know, to tie the access token to a particular identity. If that's one thing, uh, it's still uh, in you know, progress. Right. Work in progress. That's cool. The other one is also. Yeah. It can help you to restrict the token to a particular client rather than replaying it to a different device. Oh, they're long-lived certificates? Uh, so TLS client authentication, your, your client will be issued a certificate. Right. And then, and then it would keep it, it like, yeah. secretly. Yes. Yeah. OK. That's interesting, too. See, there's a lot of really good material here. I feel like somebody should be taking notes, collecting links. <laughs> Not you. Not you. Thank you. Poor Ivan. I appreciate that. Look, I wanted to let Ivan off, off the hook here. I have been sitting here since 9 a.m. and yeah, I had like no, four cups of coffee really, before really I started this. So. But I just I felt like I was going <laughs> to be talking to an empty chair, and I wasn't sure if I could persuade Clint Eastwood any of you style. to take his. What, what Clint Eastwood that? talks to empty chairs? No? Bad pol politics joke. <laughs> I've been here for a while. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to explain <laughs> that to me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, this is this is just an example. This is kind of like this is the, actually this is this conversation so far has been better than I was. I was a little worried about you all. No offense, because you were so <laughs> respectful during the earlier talks. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just I think the core message that I wanted to get at was uh, this isn't just uh, something that we have to believe in. I think actually, you know, Scale FT, uh, which of course you know, I have a corporate affiliation here. Uh, when we started out, Beyond Corp was not uh, well known. It was not a movement, and we didn't think it necessarily was going to become one because Google releasing a PDF doesn't, like, yeah, it's one thing if it's MapReduce and great, now we can have Hadoop and there's a whole open source ecosystem around it, but uh, it's another thing if it's an IT transformation journey. We're like, you know, productizing that is a major challenge. We can build software to facilitate it. But at the end of the day, someone has to lead change in the organization to make it real. And we didn't think Google was necessarily going to make the effort to do that. And so far, I'm not, if anyone from Google is in the room, you know, I'm not uh, trying to say anything negative about the big G. But I'm not sure that they're necessarily trying to facilitate it that much for other companies. I think yeah. that it's a big part of their brand, yeah. you know. So, I mean, for me, making reference to Google as like an authority for Beyond Corp has some value, but I love having an independent understanding of it. And so, actually, you know, client certificates uh, are very dear to my heart. I really love them to be short lived because, again, thinking about how these credentials transit back end systems as they act as uh, identifiers of a person, right? Uh, it's not just the fact that uh, it can't be used as a bearer. Uh, token, if because with OpenSSH CA client certificates and X509 certs, they have a uh, pinned field, which is an RSA public key. Just recapping, you know, I know we're all engineers here, just recapping. And the, presumably the true possessor of the certificate would have the private key associated with the public key in the cert. But it's because as that certificate transits all those back end systems, it more or less empowers each of the backend systems to independently verify the uh, identity of the person possessing it. So it's like a signed metadata object. This is why I love certificates. It's a signed metadata object that not only tells you something about a person, but it tells you for sure who they are, uh, which is, I think, a really valuable property in uh, but also, the longer they live, the more privileges they collect and right. gather. So that's another reason why to keep them super well, short. Well, right? yeah. So this is something Paul <laughs> used to say: is that they're a point in time at a station, and just like issuing a, um, a RSA private key to somebody is a point in time at a station. At that moment, that person is the only one who owns the private key, and so that's a very strong attestation of their identity at that moment. But five minutes later, ten minutes later. You know, if they install the Cisco WebEx Chrome extension or if something else terrible happens that causes their machine to be rooted, uh, it becomes a much weaker attestation of their identity. So that's right. why short-lived certificates are fantastic, though, because as long as your clocks are synchronized, and Google apparently has atomic clocks for this purpose, I don't have an atomic <laughs> clock. I don't even have a watch. But I'm just saying, like, uh, 
having synchronized time across a distributed system, if you could take that for granted, enables you to make a lot of uh, really valuable identity decisions throughout the system about the possessor of a certificate. I don't know. Any thoughts on that, anybody? More awesome standards to mention? <laughs> yeah. Nope. When's the last time you read the SAML spec? Oh, well, I was reading that stuff the other night, but I didn't, I just skimmed. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a kid, you know, I dreamed that I would just grow up and implement RFCs all the time. I thought that's what being a software engineer was all about, but it doesn't seem to be the case. We had a different childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm more geek shaming. Yeah. <laughs> That's not it. I'm just it's teasing. just different. It's cool. We're cool. We're cool. <laughs> we're so, cool. We're yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know. Other thoughts here? No? Nothing? How are you, how are you dealing with trust authority? <laughs> That's ah. such a great question. Good one. So if you think about it, uh, and I'm not going to answer that question on behalf of my company because I'm here anonymously just to participate in a conversation with you. I'm not trying to sell you anything. But uh, if you think about it, uh, that is a massive challenge in the distributed system of authorization. How do you uh, distribute truths about who to trust, right? This, it's kind of a recursive problem. When you have a distributed system, every, every problem that you have in it becomes in, intrinsically a distributed system problem. And in this case, you've got, uh, you know, if you think about it also, like, when you do a traditional kind of like chef or puppet-based deployment of public keys across an environment. And this is just, this is a really easy example. It's much easier to discuss than PKI, which is why I turn to it. But uh, you're implicitly establishing kind of a PKI where each public key is a trusted root of identity for that one person, right? So like from that point of view, if you have like 100 employees and 10,000 servers, you've got a million trusted roots scattered across your environment that you have to keep up to date. It's a real, it's a real challenge. Uh, and when you look at it through that lens, it seems impractical. PKI is really hard, right? And that's long-lived certificates are a major part of the problem, if you think about it. On the other hand, uh, we at ScaleFT proudly use like TLS certificates on our SaaS API, and uh, we're going to have SNI enabled, and all of that expresses an implicit belief in the trusted root system that everybody has installed on their machines. And you know, I definitely run into that problem where if a user gets creative with the root or deletes it, you know, it can create bootstrapping problems for trust. How can they download our client software if they can't trust the service it originates from, among other things? So yeah, that's a major problem, right? What would you do about it? Yeah. Right. It, anyone from Keybase here? I like Keybase's approach. Like Keybase. Yeah, it's one of those like mesh concepts. Uh, but um, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that for trusted roots. Yeah, totally. Well, it's dead air. It kills DJs. Paul's. Oh, we got Paul. I wasn't looking at him. Paul's freezing his hand. He's right in front of you. What's up? Uh, <laughs> how do you think things like secure enclaves and access to those? Oh, yeah, this is a gimme. He's just setting me up. He's just lobbing it in no, front of No, you're right. You. No, that's a real, that's a real question. Uh, how, do you trust, how do you trust that? Yeah. Uh, like, did, you, anyone, did anyone see that sweet exploit of the, I'm going to kind of jump to a related topic, the sweet exploit of the ledger uh, cryptocurrency thingy? I don't own one, so I don't really know the details. But there's a 15-year-old who... Uh, found that there was supposedly a secure coprocessor, and this coprocessor was supposedly trustworthy because it had this sweet protocol where someone was like, oh, this is great, so the processor is a limited amount of memory, I'll just make it read its entire firmware to me, and I'll verify it to prove that it is itself, right? But it turns out that if you are able to exploit uh, the coprocessor, you can overwrite the firmware with a compressed version of itself, so it can still read out its full firmware to you, but then it's gonna keep the exploit code secret. So that's just one example of how, you know, theoretically having like my sweet touch ID on my MacBook because it's got a separate processor is like a less, somehow less exploitable area, but it's still something that you have to trust. It's, you know, now your computer is a distributed system and you've got trust distributed unequally between processors and physical components in it, you know? Yeah, that's a, I don't know. How do I think about, how do you think about that? I like what Apple's doing, generally. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Intel and SGX has kind of, and under SGX, 
Index approach has kind of not been as good as I had hoped five years ago. Uh, like, the, like for example, you could do there was a Spectre attack against oh. uh, SGX, yeah, where you could extract private keys out of an SGX enclave. It's like that's exactly what it was not supposed to allow you to do. Right. right? Like, well, you know, the solution to that is a real-time operating system. And that, honestly, I would trust hardware, uh, like secure hardware systems more if they had RTOSs. Sure. But like, I, I, I like what Apple does with their co-processors, but they're still probably pretty secure. But like, do you trust Intel? Do you trust AMD to do this stuff right? Like, it's hard yeah. to even trust them. And they're, you don't have a choice. You're going to buy an Intel chip. Right. Probably. Yeah. Maybe I'm a little less likely to now than I was like a year ago, but I'm still probably yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, this is more doom and gloomy than I meant to be. I was kind of like, look, Lunch! let's be constructive. <laughs> We're engineers. Let's solve problems. But actually, the problems are really hard, and so maybe you know we can't. And probably Beyond Corp isn't the answer. But I think that when you think about, you know, uh, the SAML spec from 18 years ago, there's, I think there's probably been a lot of progress made in how we can build these systems. And in part, uh, from my point of view, that's because we have better access to. Uh, like crypto now than we did back then. Uh, so when I think about whatever that year that was, 2000. Cryptography. Yeah, yeah. Just when making I think it about, clear. Yeah, no, that's, I was trying not to make that distinction. But uh, when, I, when I think about that time though, it was kind of like you had uh, almost no HTTPS. I, was it, it was called HTTPS, but it was also called SSL back then. TLS as a name hadn't come around and like, uh, you know, that was just something that I guess came at, like somebody made up at Netflix, and most of the internet traffic at the time was clear text because the concept is that nobody's going to be able to harvest it anyway. Uh, and so it's kind of like, well, if you want to have some encrypted communication, I guess you, your application is going to need to be able to implement it, and I hope that you can do something that a browser can understand if you want to interact with a human being. Uh, and so that's why you end up with, like, now it's 2018, and I don't know that I can count off the top of my head how many TLS implementations I've seen in Python. But, you know, that's a factoring question, ultimately. The question is, how do you divide up those responsibilities? Where does the responsibility for providing, uh, like, an implementation of some type of crypto routine belong, right? And so down the road a little bit, you've got OpenSSL, still called OpenSSL, providing, like, a shared uh, crypto layer that applications can theoretically use. And, yeah, that mostly works, and it's only had some incredibly huge issues that uh, we really hope those developers can fix. But... At the end of the day, it's a factory question. Is it better to have the OpenSSL team working on that one place where most of us can get pretty good crypto, or is it crypto cryptography, or is it uh, is it something that we should expect individual application developers to implement, and or is it something that you should be able to trust your like we heard I think it was Scala was it wasn't yeah. David from Coursera was talking about Scala. It's like well yeah when the JVM at one time it was considered completely normal that you would just implement all that stuff in your in your JVM runtime because you wanted to be system agnostic, but maybe it's important to be able to link against native libraries for certain things, or maybe these services should be provided by the operating system. I mean, it's a, I think it's a complex topic, and it all speaks back to uh, the fundamental like layering, abstraction, and division of responsibility decisions that we make when we talk about authorization. So from my point of view, this is all part and parcel with, sorry to bring it all back around, but why uh, authorization should be in layer seven and why that layer of abstraction is more correct than trying to serialize these trust decisions out to whether it's public keys or network ACLs, you know? I think that was the right topic, which is, and I think we're gonna lead into lunch now. Okay. Now. Oh, oh, good. Oh, Sorry, we have one more question. Go ahead. Please do, please do, please do. Oh, good. So going back to the other kind of crypto. Um, uh oh, I'm gonna let Ivan take this we one. Made it to 12:30. I don't have I don't have the net worth to be qualified to speak on this. Okay, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I, well, I, let's get back to uh, the root of trust. That's exactly where I was going to take it. So yeah, it just comes down to how effectively you can communicate about trusted roots. Well, so you don't have to. I think that's the point, really. 
But no, but you do have to. It's oh. decentralized, but you yeah. still must distribute the truth about trust. But it's right? not a rooted trust. It, it's always rooted in well, something. Maybe not. That's the whole point. I think this is a topic for discussion. <laughs> I don't think you, you. I don't think you can bootstrap tr bootstrap trust out of nowhere. So you, it, yeah. you, we have to transitively build on it's trust a, it's relationships. A consensus versus centralized. Root oh, a issue. consensus, like right, a so consensus about the root of trust. A consensus about trust is, is not the root, maybe. I don't know. In, yeah, yeah there's right. A, there's a lot of things. Whoever so can you, spend the most money <laughs> on electricity. Well, that's not yeah, the I don't have a good answer for that. But I, I think there's something there for sure. Um, but again, there's something there. Yeah. What is the something? That part's still you know, not my Coinbase account. basically, what I've <laughs> what I've learned uh, from life more than anything else is that if you have a distributed systems problem, you should probably use a consensus algorithm. But n not in that case, I, I would not think. But anyway, sh should there's we call people it? People working on some interesting projects. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough. That's for sure. But it could could be. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have food. Is it next door? I mean, not next door. It's it's in the other room. Ten minutes. Oh, but we have a lot of pastries. Pastries here, in the back. coffee here. Um, we got some space marked, uh, roped off in the main room, so we're going to be hanging out. So I, can, I encourage everybody to stick around, continue to ask questions, continue the conversation. Um, yeah, awesome. We did yeah. it. <laughs> first Beyond Corp Community Lounge Day. I'd much rather lounge. <laughs> How does it? Yeah, grab a T-shirt, grab some. So when are you Swag. Pay for